Hello, welcome to the Wednesday, May 29th, 2019 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from San Antonio, Texas. It's always great to have readers submit uh, malware samples to us. Even better if the reader then publish the blog post with some additional analysis of the sample. So we do have uh, two posts actually here to refer to. The first one is by Didier's uh, part of our diary where he goes over how to extract the PowerShell script that was Base64 encoded in this particular Office document that the reader submitted. Admitted. The reader himself then uh, went from there and did additional analysis. As part of the show notes, you'll find two links. Uh, one is to DDA's diary entry and one is to the blog published by the reader submitting this sample. Well, it looks like we still have to talk about the RDP vulnerability Blue Keep or CVE 2019-07-08. Well, it's about two weeks since we got a patch for this vulnerability. The latest news here is an internet wide scan by Robert Cram. Now, he's a reputation of doing these type of scans quite diligently. He first just scanned for IP address that have port 3389 listening. Well, uh, 7.6 million results came back. However, it turned out that only half of them were running remote desktop. He did an additional scan using RDP scan. That's a scanner for the vulnerability that uh, he wrote and actually it is open sourced so you can use it yourself against your network if you wish to do so. And in the end, he ended up with a little bit less than a million, about 923,000 vulnerable hosts that are exposed to the internet. So about a third of the RDP servers that are exposed to the internet are vulnerable. Now, I guess you can conjecture here that if people are exposing RDP to the internet, then there's a good chance, like a one in three chance, they're not patching either, which uh, sort of could imply that if RDP is exposed to the internet, well, that's the real problem that you need to address. And it's probably just an indicator of other basic sort of network hygiene and so uh, not really being in place. And a worm taking over a million different servers certainly could have a substantial impact on the internet overall, depending on how these servers will then be used. Now, going back to the May Microsoft update, another vulnerability that I pointed out was the vulnerability in the DHCP client. And we had a number of these vulnerabilities in Microsoft DHCP clients lately, some of them related to the addition of this feature of a DNS search domain lists. Well, uh, SensePost now came up with a real nice analysis of the latest vulnerability and how it is really sort of a continuation of a vulnerability that was patched back in January. So these different DHCP client vulnerabilities are certainly related. SensePost goes into quite a bit of details as to what went wrong here as these uh, domain search lists uh, were actually parsed by the Microsoft DHCP client. So the end result was that January's patch was not really complete and as a result we had a second vulnerability that was then patched in May. And Bleeping Computer has the latest example of a phishing email taking advantage of Microsoft's own file hosting within Azure. By doing so, the attacker can host a phishing page that looks quite legit on a domain that's actually associated with Microsoft and that's HTTPS protected. In this particular example that was featured here, the email claims to come from Microsoft and indicates that files were deleted from the user's account and then of course offers a link back to Windows .net, uh, which is uh, the Azure domain being abused here to ask the user to confirm these file deletion events. And that's of course where then the user's password is getting fished. 
Overall, I don't find the email that terribly convincing, but uh, certainly possible for a user to fall for it. And uh, then of course, the windows.net domain does sort of you know, make it much more plausible to a user to actually then enter their password. Lesson learned here, uh, you can't really protect your users uh, from falling for these phishing attacks. Two-factor authentication is probably your best bet here. And talking about two-factor authentication, uh, remember on Tuesday, I'll be having another uh, webcast uh, talking about the future of authentication and the reason what happens beyond uh, two-factor authentication, so some of these new standards that are being developed there. This is it for today. Thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.